Jerome here. We're going to talk about the outreach to the Latino community and I'm just going to go. I don't want to talk the whole time in between. Feel free to ask me questions, interrupt. I don't know it all, trust me. And if I don't know it all, I will do my best to answer the questions as best I can. But for the state of Washington, I work with the Northwest Ministry Network in the church planting aspect of planting Hispanic churches. It's a growing minority group in the state of Washington. And uh, there's a lot of churches that are starting to catch on that they need to be planting or have some sort of Spanish ministry. And so um, what, what has started because of that is I've been working with a lot of English churches. English-speaking churches have launched Spanish ministries. And many people see the language as the biggest barrier, and I can't do it because I don't have somebody who speaks Spanish on my team. The language is not a barrier whatsoever. Mm. The, the primary way you're going to reach these families is through the kids. So uh, I titled it Mi Casa Su Casa, familiar phrase, my, house is, my home is your home. So something very, uh, it's family driven in the Hispanic community. So um, tell you a little bit about, this is my family, all boys. We grew up in Eastern Washington. My father lived in, or worked, we came here, I can't tell you how we came here because it's not legal, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we came here and my father worked as a, in the Apple Orchards in Eastern Washington. So I got to see it from the ground up, mm. living here. I just became a citizen three years ago. It took me six years to get my citizenship, mm. quite a while. And through that whole process, growing up, I didn't even know I was not a citizen <laughs> until I started applying for colleges and that my parents told me, well, here's the deal. Wow. And it's a shocker when you're like, wait, I can't apply for this or do that. So there's some kids that don't, they don't see cultural differences. Um, they just see, hey, I'm like everybody else. Yeah. So it's a cool thing to understand. And the, the best way to reach out to the Latino community is know your, your immediate community around that church, around that surrounding area. And so um, how many of you have heard of Mission Insight? None? Well, it's a quick program that the network has, and I, I want to give you my phone number and email because what I'm able to do is where your church is located, find the zip code area or that city you're in, and give you a full detailed report of the ethnic diversity in your group. It can break down the Hispanic community by age group, by where they're from, by what their occupation might be, and it'll give you a better idea of what you're, you should be targeting, what you should be... Uh, looking for in the Hispanic community. And so what was that called again? Mission Insight. Is it just for the Latino community? Or it's is it for, for, it's in general. It'll break down Filipino, I mean, wow. any any culture. Wow. It'll break it down. The network uses this, the Assemblies of God uses this strategically when they're planting churches because they want, when they, they don't, it's not a hit or miss, they want to make sure they're aiming at the right target group, the right community, and things like that. So, um, I use the term, people ask me a lot of the time, w w w do we use the term Hispanic? No, no, English I'm fine. I'm fine, yeah. <laughs> uh, people ask me the term Hispanic or uh, Latino or Mexican-American. I prefer the term Latino, and this is my preference, because that encompasses all of Mexico, Central America, and mm -hmm. Southern America. Mm -hmm. When you say, when you just say, use the word Hispanic, you're assuming Mexican. Or if you say Mexican, you're assuming just Mexican. And there are some people that will be very offended by that when you're approaching them. Because lots of my friends are from Honduras, Guatemala, Colombia. I mean, and you do you want to be very sensitive to that. So you, if you're Latino, where are you from? Then that gives them the opportunity to share what country in Latin America they're from and all that stuff. So not everybody eats tortillas like I do. <laughs> people eat a lot of other different Amen. stuff. So that's why I, I prefer the, the term Latino. And, and know this. What I'm giving you is, is I want to help you kind of give a, a general perspective, but understand that what you're doing in your community may not work in the other communities mm -hmm. because of the specific uh, Latino people that live there, because of the specific uh, area that they're from. Um, some people, you know, they gather in clusters and, and tend to work that way. Eastern Washington's different from the Latinos that live in Western Washington. Eastern Washington, you got more of the migrant workers. They might come for a season, work, head back. Some end up staying, and a lot of them will head back, but their kids end up staying in the area. Western Washington, you got a lot of the uh, working in, in industry, uh, lay, uh, manual labor, construction, whatnot, all that. So there's a very distinct difference there. Um, 
and then I've, using one approach to evangelism is, is not really practical. Practical. So the, there's three ways to identify when you're working with a, with a Latino community, and uh, and it's assimilation. There's three different levels of assimilation within the United States uh, that happens in since there. And by assimilation, I mean people are at three different points in their life. There, you got number one, you have the people that have uh, the nuclear ethnic people that have recently arrived at the U.S. They just speak Spanish, and they're at different stages. So that's one group of people. <laughs> Second it is the traditional ethnic. They've lived in the U.S. for several years, speak some English, and learning some of the U.S. culture and how to how to do that kind of stuff. And third is they're fully assimilated. And I would consider myself in between two and three. Uh, residents speak mostly English, culture is mostly U.S., but associates with others less assim assimilated. So the thing to note is, is you might be thinking, how do I reach out to these Hispanic community, the Latino community, the people that speak Spanish around me? It's going to be through the kids. Growing up, I was the translator for my parents when it came to legal documentation, when it came to all that stuff. Why? Because I was the only one in school the whole day speaking English. So I'm living two different, I, I felt like I was living two different worlds, literally speaking English, and then at home it was only Spanish, which was yeah. a good rule to have, so I never forgot my Spanish. Yes? So with that, um, did you ever feel that your parents, maybe your mom or dad, didn't feel, uh, not valued, but because the child had to translate, did it like demean them, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. I think what happened was it helped me grow up. Okay. And it helped the, his, me as a young Latino boy mature faster because I was using big terms and talking, doing some, you know, it's not little stuff when you're translating for the medical purposes or whatnot. I was learning to do all of that. So these are the three different areas, and you may have a mixture of all, all three of these. Yeah. And some of you may just have this section here, which means that you can do your entire kids' ministry, everything in English, and the children will understand, the parents are there. Here is where you can still do everything in English, but for the parents you made it do, do some translations, some stuff in Spanish. Here, everything needs to be in, in Spanish. And so there's, there's three different levels that you need to be able to identify with, when working with that. And for myself, uh, the thing I found is when in doubt, you just go bilingual. And then you talk to the kids and connect with them through that way. So. Um, one of the things we could go ahead. Does it is it hard on the kids to live in that dual community? I mean, so like as a kids pastor, you got a kid that comes in mm -hmm. who is from a Latino family and is doing those bilingual translation things. Is it good for us to offer an opportunity for the kids to just be kids? I mean, is that to them? There's no difference. That's there's the no norm. difference. That's the norm. Okay, gotcha. So I, you don't need to cater to one or the gotcha. other. To me, that, I mean, I didn't feel I didn't realize I was different until I moved to. Western Washington. Gotcha. Literally, growing up in Eastern Washington, everybody's it's either Hispanic or there's a lot more diversity. Coming to college, for some people, I was the first Hispanic Latino descent person I had ever met. I felt sorry for them because they were missing out. <laughs> so, um, what can we do? You might the thing you might be asking here is, what can I do with my church, with my ministry, to reach out to the Latino people in my area? Um, it's simple things, very simple things. So these are examples from other churches, and I've worked with some churches that are doing this and that have implemented uh, where the Spanish, they have a Spanish pastor now. This took time to get there, but what they first started doing is offering English as a second language classes. Ask around your church who's willing to, I mean, basic English. And you go, and, and for, his, for the, these homes, for these Latino homes, you go to their home, they don't care about door to door in the Amer in the American community. If you come to somebody's door, you know they have the signs: no soliciting, right. don't come here. Yeah. The Latino community, you, you come. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we'll take it. And it's easy to do English as a second language class is valuable. Hispanic themed meals. Churches have done this. For example, would be Creekside Church in the Mill Creek area. They connected. I helped them launch their Spanish ministry. Connected them with their Spanish pastor. This is huge. Immigration and citizenship. Citizenship legal assistance uh, through legal services. 
you might know an attorney or a, a lawyer who, who works in this area who's aware of what the law, because the law is constantly changing. And um, what they do is, other churches have done this. If you live in Western Washington, there's a radio station called Radio Luz, Radio Light, uh, 1680 AM. They have on their calendar things they do, and they're a Christian radio station, and they offer these kind of services. They advertise them big at different Spanish churches, so if you want to see what they're doing. But talk within your church, what can you offer as far as, uh, you know, with the health care reform thing happening? They, they just need basic education. If I have a hard time, we have a hard time understanding things, imagine, <laughs> imagine them, you know? Uh, and then access to community re resources is just temporary employment and, 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 and things like that. The church, um, I'm using Creeks as an example, that's the recent church I work with. Their uh, Spanish congregation, Spanish speaking congregation, they have landscapers, construction workers, all that stuff. So the church is working together. The Latinos that are have those businesses are working in that area, helping maintain the church now helping do all the projects in the church so the English speaking church no longer has to outsource those things or pay but they're considered one one community, one body. Any questions up to this point? If I'm moving too fast, let me know. I want to make sure I have enough uh, time for questions. So those are simple things we can do. Uh, English as a second language. Uh, free events. This is key. They will not come if you have to pay a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. And you're probably thinking, I have to invest. Yes. You do. And I'm going to jump ahead of this because I, I want to say this now. It's in one of my further slides. But we so easily give to missions overseas. And are so, we're going to give and we're going to do a mission trip to Mexico. But let me tell you this. The mission field is coming to your doorstep. It's so easy to give over there. Why not give money here, where they're right outside your doors, right outside the area where you're at? Right. So that's that's crucial. Is it's, it's going to be an investment. So free events, which which is key to the Hispanic community, because a lot of them, um, they're struggling to be completely honest with you. Some might be doing well than others, and, and it's and it's different. Evaluate your community. Evaluate your area. I know. I know. Latino families that are doing well off, they're doing great, but there are some that are on the other side of the spectrum. So just evaluate that um, and connect with that. I connected with a family um, that helped me. I didn't know how to apply for college, how to do any of that stuff. So I was in high school, and this was an uh, English, uh, forgive me for using this term, if you're offended by it, for a white, white family who were my neighbors. They took me in, and they just said, hey, do you need help? And, they helped me apply for scholarships, get my college applications all in. I didn't know how to do anything because my parents didn't know anything of that stuff. So I know that's high school, but for children, I mean, if you start to develop that relationship, that trust, and you helping him with that, you offer that help, that speaks volumes to the Latino families. Um, immigration seminars is that thing, so you talk with attorneys and that stuff, or people in your in your church that are educated in that stuff, but. It's the immigration, teaching English as a second language, <coughs> doing free events for the kids. I have a, there's a church, I have a church, there's a church in uh, um, the Maltby and Monroe area, a little bit of the outskirts out here. They did a vacation Bible school, and they had no idea that the Monroe, Maltby area was almost half a Latino population. So they advertised <coughs> the vacation Bible school, and they advertised there's going to be food and stuff for the kids. Guess who showed up? Who was? How did they advertise? They advertised uh, through. I'm trying to think of what uh, David said. Mostly putting up posters around the community, and uh, word of mouth is the other way. And then they have some people that work in the elementary school in the oh. schools, so they help through that way. But <clears throat> to uh, to answer that question, if you're saying how do I advertise to the Latino community? Go door to door, find those neighborhoods. Say, hey, free food, people will show up, and we'll take care of your kids or for a few short hours or whatever it may be. But they had an overwhelming response of Latino students, kids, elementary kids. At first, they were scared. They're thinking, how are we going to do this? But then they started engaging with these students. They all speak English <laughs> because they're all in school. 
you don't need to change your curriculum. And many people say, well, I can't start a Spanish-speaking ministry because I don't have anybody who's bilingual. I don't have anybody who can translate all my stuff. Or I don't know. It's all in English. They're learning that stuff. If you get the kids and the kids get excited about it, the, the family is coming right behind them. Yep. And when I mean family, I mean parents, grandparents, <laughs> uncles, and aunts. Because when you knock on one door, it's not just one Latino living there, it's the whole, yeah. the whole shebang, everybody. <laughs> so. But then you do have the issue of needing to speak Spanish. Then that's, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, and that's where you start to see that. But when you start taking care of the kids, and you show them that you appreciate the kids, man, you'll win them over in a heartbeat. And even if they don't understand, the English force, they'll still come to your gatherings, to your worship services. Why? Because they're not sitting there bored. They're learning the language because they need to learn it, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll be in, taking it in and everything. I just want to give an example. Yep. My husband's mom came from Mexico. She never, you know, she doesn't speak a word of English. And our church, it's only English. We're the only Hispanics in that church for eight years we've gone there. But she's, a, you know, Spanish only. She lived with us for a year, and every time she sat in that service, she was touched by the Holy Spirit. And she would tell me at the end of the service, is this what the pastor talked about? I mean, I'm, wow. she would like tell me exactly what the pastor talked about. Because when the Holy Spirit moves, I mean, yeah. they get fed in their own you know, spiritual language. Mm -hmm. So don't let that scare you guys. Yeah. And what, what, when you, if you guys, I'm sorry. But if you guys planning to go into the Hispanic uh, uh, ridge, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Remember, walk in faith. God always provides. Mm -hmm. He will provide the right person for you guys to help it, help you through. Sorry. No, no, no. That's true. <laughs> and going back to what you said first, um, I come from a predominantly 98% Hispanic population where I was at. And the children will help you. <laughs> the children will be your biggest tools. If you foster the, the, their um, love for God and you really engage with them and tr gain their trust. It doesn't matter if your parent only speaks Spanish. The kid will translate for you mm -hmm. because that's what you're meant to do as a child. I, I'm a Hispanic child myself. That's what you do. That's, it's, it's already understood that you do it because you go yep. to school mm -hmm. and that's the way it is. And if they don't see it as, oh my gosh, I'm wasting my life away. It's just the way life is. Yeah. Hmm. So it's, it's normal. Yeah. I had a question. I'm curious about this. I don't want to think it's too off topic, but I know that many of our churches, and some of our churches, some members of the churches are pretty conservative politically, and of course, issues of immigration are a little touchy. I remember a situation at my father in law's house once a few years ago. We had some, it was a holidays and Thanksgiving, and a friend from church whose family does missions work in Texas on the border, so they're very aware of these issues, was having holiday dinner with us. My father-in-law's family, who's very conservative politically and lives in New York, so has no idea about any of this, was just shooting their mouth off about whatever. Really offended, obviously, um, my friend's family. How do you how, how do you navigate some of these issues as politics come up and people, you know, with immigration and whatnot? Or do you have any suggestions or pointers for pastorally how we can think about it? You you offer help in any way you can. So I get approached by even Latino families. And they say I need to, especially pastors, because we have a lot of. The, there's a shortage of Spanish pastors that are bilingual and citizens. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of first generations that just speak Spanish and are struggling through the whole immigration yeah. issue. So the biggest thing we can do as a leader, as a pastor to do to help, is offer help in any way you can. Mm -hmm. So one, help in connecting them with an attorney, someone who, who knows the legal ins and loopholes, ins and outs. Two, don't just send them off and say, okay, go ahead, figure it out. Okay, what else is going on? What else do you need help? Because a lot of the document, the documents they have to do to get legal status, they're all in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what can you help? Well, they need help. I mean, I've done numerous amounts of translating letters or things like that for them to help them in any way. So it's just offering help and just being there, walking it with them, yeah. so that they don't feel like they're walking it by themselves. And that walk, for some people, it's months. For me, it was six years, and. The rest of my family was born here. My, my brothers were born here, so it was a lot easier for them. But it's just walking that with them. And you don't even have to touch, it doesn't matter where you stand, don't touch the issue of this is right, this is wrong. No. I mean, my wife yeah, and I got in a little discussion because my wife's half Filipino, half Ukrainian, so she's not Latina. <laughs> and she had her identity stolen as a child 
mm. by a Latino man. Mm. And she said, why do they come in here today? And they, they stole her social, they, rest, they ruined her credit. And so I sat her down and I walked, I said, well, this is, my, I, know, I know how you're, I know you feel frustrated, but my parents did that. We'll cut that part out. But uh, <laughs> they, they, they had to do that. You have to survive. You, you have to survive somehow. Mm -hmm. like, and I told her, look at the plus side. You know, as they were paying taxes and all that stuff, it's going, everything's going to your social security, so at least it's going to you. So, right? so, so, so there's that, there's that tension, there's that, but you, and, but it's, it's a fine line to walk, and you just walk with them and, and, and guide them through it. Yeah. So, what am I, I talked about kids being uh, the key. Uh, parents, this is huge. When they come here, mostly the first and second generation, uh, the first two levels of assimilation. Once they're fully assimilated, they have groups they connect with. They're more Americanized, quote unquote. But the first two levels of assimilation, the families are looking for a place to connect. The kids don't have a social group or kids, or they don't do play dates. I didn't le learn that term until I was actually in high school and college. Play, I didn't even know what that was. I just showed up at my friend's house. Hey. You want to, let's go out and do something. <coughs> so the parents are actively seeking, what, what can my kid do? Why? Because they've come here with a mentality, I need to give my kid a better life. How do I do that? And so what they're, they're actively seeing, but some of them, are, the thing that ha holds them back, and you're thinking they're too shy or they're too quiet, they're not sure with this whole immigration thing, they're not sure who they can trust. Right. Growing up in Eastern Washington, there was a guy who owned an uh, orchard land, hired all these migrant workers, hired hundreds of them. What he did is called immigration. They all showed up for work the next day and there were buses waiting for them there. Oh. This is true. This is, I've lived it. And so, I mean, that's just, it's just, they don't know who they can trust. And this was in Eastern, and, you know, things have changed, but I still remember that. So they're a little hesitant about you know who they can, but if you come and approach them and say, "I'm here to take care of your kids. We want to make your kids better. We want to help them. They're going to be all in. If you're about my kids, what can I do?" So though, that's huge. Um, the reason I, I talk about the financial part of them, a lot of them don't do go to movies, don't do all that stuff because living on a tight budget financially. Yeah. So if you provide. You might think it's the silliest idea to do a church carnival, do a church harvest festival. What do you want to do? Something. These kids will come in like crazy. And if you just do that, and, and what you can be doing while the kids are having fun, make sure your adults are intentional, whether they speak Spanish or not, are about mingling with these people. Because what the Latinos will do, they'll sit up, stand up to the side, let my kids do their thing. But if you step out of your comfort zone, and are willing to approach them and connect with them. Hey, them, they approached me. I didn't have to go approach them and ask them for direction or how to do this. They, they're willing to connect with me because there's still some families that will see themselves lower than the the uh, the white middle class or whatever it may be. So, be able to step out of that comfort zone, and, and it takes time to do that. And so, what I joke around with uh, my wife because she's learning Spanish. I'm sorry, you need to go in there. If you want to learn Spanish, go talk to them. Mm. So I connected with a friend who hardly speaks English from our church. She's Colombian. She's trying to learn English. So I told him, you guys become best friends. <laughs> Teach each other. And it becomes fun. But you do start to learn from one another. And that's important. Why? Because then you show them, hey, you can teach me something too. I'm not only here to teach you. I want to learn from you. So doing stuff for the families is um, really important. Any other questions up to this point? I don't want to brush over anything. When you're working with the kids, I touched on this a little bit, the whole family will come. It will take time, but yeah, we talked about that. Back to school events are huge. Because these kids, I remember reusing, I mean, we don't buy backpacks every year. We don't do this. I mean, we did with what we got. So those are at least from what I've seen it might be different in your community but from what I've seen doing this for the community and then going out door to door don't be afraid to do that don't like you said don't be afraid to approach them in their neighborhood or 
go to the uh, taqueria stands, the taco trucks, while people are standing out there, hey, hey, you got kids. We're giving away free school supplies. And have your kid come, and I mean, you'll, you'll draw in a lot of students that way. So those are another key things. And then um, these are some little quotes I've been, had from working with other English-speaking pastors. I said, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to start a Spanish ministry or outreach? You have to make a total financial commitment with your resources. You can't go half-heartedly. I'm not saying everything goes, but what one church did is they realized we're giving a lot to missions, which is great. Praise God for that. But let's use a percentage for that for the missions here and the people that are living around us. So it's not that we have to raise more money or do other things, but let's cut a piece of the pie out and use it for what we have here. Um, ensure that you're investing in resources. I touched on this part a little bit. Um, I want to be here as a resource to you, so I put my information here. Feel free to write down my email. If you want a report of your community where your uh, church is located at, I can get that to you and be emailed. And it'll break down not just the Latino community, but like you said, every, the whole ethnic background there too average income in that area, things like that. And it'll be emailed to you as a PDF file. So it'll take me some time, but I can love to help you in that area because it's important to know who lives in your neighborhood. So, I don't know, any other questions, comments, concerns? Do you yeah. have like, um, I'm thinking at our church we have a secretary and she's like bilingual, like she speaks like four different languages. And she's the one who connects to the Latinos or whoever yeah. can speak language. But um, it's like, do you have, I mean, I'm thinking she can translate, but like, do you have like packets of like, because um, like you're saying, like the backpacks, like giving things out, thinking like putting the supplies in the backpack, but like having translation of, you know, in Spanish, just of like, uh -huh. think about Jesus in Spanish, uh -huh. and about our church in Spanish. Yeah, like, so I, mean, I, like, I don't do have, have I don't have anything. Like, I'd be willing to do that if it's emailed to me. But also, look at your sc the schools. I'm also work actively with the uh, AWSP, the student principals the uh, education program for the state of Washington. So I'm in the middle schools and high schools as well doing these kind of things because they're seeing they have to do things in Spanish too. So they do little stuff. So what you need to do, connect with the school. They have a lot of uh, uh, teacher's aides and assistants that have to speak Spanish. Tell them what you're doing for the church. We want to do this for the kids. Could you translate this? Because we want to give them backpacks and all stuff. So it's not like you're... You may not go to my church, but hey, will you help us? We're for the same cause here. Let's help yeah. the Latino community. So I'm in both spectrums working this part, but also in school. I'll be in Tenasca, Eastern Washington next week doing a full day training with uh, middle school level kids over there, uh, Spanish speaking kids. So, but that's one idea. Um, Google Translator and all that stuff doesn't really work sometimes. Might get the gist, <laughs> but. I say connect with the school. Find some of There's people that are bilingual. You can have one of the kids. Hey, how do you write this in English? How would you say this? Very important. So we, we just had our trunk retreat, and we had a ton of uh, Latino uh, families come. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? The next step we're currently working on. And like I said, there's a shortage. We want a credential ministry. We want to develop those leaders, but there's no pipeline. Mm -hmm. So a few months ago, I was down in LABI, which is a Latin Bible Institute in Los Angeles. <coughs> they are developing, and it's a two-year college. The students graduate there with you know, the purpose of going into ministry, whether it be child, youth, or kid ministry, youth, or adult, you know, uh, pastoral, whatever, maybe. What we're working on right now is getting those students, as soon as they graduate, they are credentialed, they're ready to go, coming up here and serving with the church. So that's one. The other side of that is, uh, and we'll be announcing this in January, so I'm kind of jumping the ball on this, but if you're a church that's saying we need a young leader, Latino leader, bilingual, that wants to help, that university would is, or that college, Bible college, is wanting to partner with the Northwest Ministry Network. That student will come serve at your church for the summer. For the summer, 
you develop that relationship, you help them pay tuition and books and stuff, and it's a Bible college, so it's not very expensive. I don't know, I don't want to say a figure because I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's, you help them with some sort of scholarship so they'll go back fall, spring, come back again in the summer and continue to help you develop Spanish-speaking ministry. Two years, you never know. And that might be the person who ends up coming back and leading that ministry. <coughs> so the next step is kind of being developed and we're working on that. And right now we have at least five students in the pipeline. And the thing that makes it so difficult is we have a lot of Spanish-speaking leaders that want to serve, but to be a credentialed minister and for all the legal aspects, they have to be uh, have a citizenship. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the, the tough thing right there. So these students come fully bilingual, citizenship, creden you're going to be credentialed and ready to go. So that's the next step. And so if, stay in contact with me and by January, February, we want to start developing that program. And if you're interested in want to talk to your pastor and say, we need a student like this, we can support them with $500 some uh, quarter or semester, whatever it may be. Um, I'll be going down there in the spring and awarding the first free scholarships. There are some churches I've already jumped on board and say, we need this. So it's something worth investing in completely. Because uh, we're now seeing churches uh, that are, need a pastor. And what they really need is a lead pastor there who's bilingual. Who's Bilingual is willing to do bilingual multicultural ministry, so it's huge, very huge. I don't know where we're at with that time. You do. Um, so that's that. Tomorrow, uh, Hector Garza from the Tri Cities area will be here, and this is on the other side of the spectrum. They're a Spanish church who had to change their children's ministry to be bilingual English and Spanish. <coughs> Why? Because the kids were learning all English and they were losing their young people because they wanted to keep it all in Spanish and the kids they're in school, you know, they want English. So they've developed a program in their children's ministry where it's all bilingual. So he may have more resources uh, as far as translations and things like that. Or his name is Hector Garza. He'll be doing I'll be doing a workshop with him tomorrow tomorrow morning at nine thirty. So um, so it's not, it's now it's the Spanish church is having to retain that Latino community too. Mm. So they're having to develop things. And if they don't stay cutting edge, you lose, you lose your kids. <coughs> so, any other questions or, was this helpful? I mean, yes. somewhat, yes. Did, it, yes. did it help at all? And feel free to call, uh, shoot me an email, whatever I can do to help. Uh, if I can come even to help, I'd love to do that, so trust me. I'm very passionate about this. And, uh, so I'll be helping you. <laughs> <laughs> There's more out there.